Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome, and uh, it is a very high honor for me uh, to have the chance to introduce our next keynote speaker uh, of the morning, Mr. Erwin Lutter. Allow me to say a few words of background about Mr. Lutter. Mr. Lutter became a member of the FDP party back in 1995. He then served as deputy chairman of the FDP since 95 uh, for the local branch in Eichach. From 1997 until 2008, he was the district chairman of the FDP Eichach Friedberg. He was deputy district chairman, I'm sorry, uh, since 2005, he was deputy district chairman of the FDP Schwabia. He's also a member of the LFA Health and Labor and Social Affairs. And in 2009, uh, he joined the foundation uh, where he was the chairman of the Association of Liberal Medical Association. He's been serving as a counselor uh, in ICAC since 2002. From 2002 until 2008, uh, he was the speaker and cultural, affair, uh, cultural officer in ICAC. And he's also been a member of the county council in 2008 of ICAC Friedberg. Since November 1st, 2008, he's been serving as a member of the German parliament, constituency Augsburg Land. He's a, also a member of the Committee on Health, and he's a substitute member of the Committee of Labor and Social Affairs. So we very much look forward to his lecture uh, today. The lecture title I will read as well uh, is Strengthening of Intercultural Understanding on the Parliamentary Level. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in a very, very warm welcome for Mr. Erwin Lutter. Thank you. Dear Mr. Donfried, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the warm welcome. And as you mentioned, I have been a member of the Bundestag, the German parliament, for four years now. The word parliament is derived from the French word parler, meaning to talk. Talking, conversations between people, the exchange of ideas and opinions, these have always been central to communication between different cultures. If people don't talk to each other, they can't get to know each other. Thus, the parliaments of this world have a special role to play in encouraging discourse between cultures and in helping them to understand each other. In Germany, multiculturalism is a controversial topic, as are the pros and cons of globalization. The more foreign, the cultures competing with us economically and socially seem to us Central Europeans, <coughs> the greater the mental gap that makes it difficult for us to really understand our potential partners and to develop a constructive relationship with them. Personally, I prefer the term interculturalism. It implies interest in exploring other cultures, getting to know them, and striking a balance between those aspects to which we take a critical view and those that bring us close together. We do not need to show understanding for anything and everything, but we do need to accept each other and learn to treat each other with respect and courtesy. After the Second World War, cautious rapprochement was especially vital for the countries of Europe, whose cultures, for all the exchange between them, had developed along essentially national lines over the centuries. The starting point of the European project, a process which only took flight after the countries had spent many years getting to know one another, was the, the rapprochement between Germany and France <coughs> after a long history fraught with misunderstandings and wars. Then in the 1960s and 70s, the countries of Southern Europe came into the picture. Up until then, these countries had primarily existed in the German consciousness as exotic places fueled through a rosy lens of romantic yearning. But as more and more guest workers from Spain, Italy and Greece came to Germany, and as the economic miracle allowed increasing numbers of Germans to travel, 
a clearer picture began to emerge of the social realities and problems in those countries and of what we shared with their cultures and where they differed from us. I grew up this time in the 1960s and 70s. From an early age I was fascinated by the lives of people in other nations, not least because of the location of my hometown Munich which is relatively close to our neighbors in southern and western Europe. During that time, I also developed a lively interest in something that is crucial to cultural exchange. Irrespective of goodwill, of shared interests, fostered by music and sport, what counts more than anything is making the effort to master foreign languages. Today, I'm more than happy about the fact that my consistent efforts led me to acquire a good knowledge of the French and some Southern European languages. These skills have helped me to engage with other people and their cultures and thus to establish close links with them. Such experiences have strengthened my belief that making the effort to learn the other's language is helpful, perhaps even crucial, to building successful relationships between cultures. That does not mean we have to take things as far, sending three-year-olds to Chinese lessons, as some particularly ambitious parents here in Germany are doing. Nevertheless, there is an undeniably positive trend. As a politician and as a concerned individual, I support any efforts to foster among my fellow Germans an interest in learning foreign languages. The same applies to people from other countries, be they Greek, Russian, Japanese or Argentinian. When organizations with an international presence like the Goethe Institute, the Institut Francais and the British Council succeeded in getting foreigners interested in learning those languages, they are making an invaluable contribution to intercultural friendship. This is because the more people can talk to each other and read and understand documents, articles and statements in other languages, the more they can go beyond just a superficial knowledge of the culture in question and the deeper their friendship will be. What is true for individuals is also true for the various organizational levels of political life. I believe that twinning arrangements between towns in different countries make an invaluable contribution in this respect. As a cultural advisor in my current hometown of Eichach, I am delighted by any opportunity for direct exchange with our twin town Avor in France. Looking to the future, I think it would be particularly, particularly useful to establish partnerships with towns and cities in Eastern Europe as we spent many long decades cut off from each other's cultures. <coughs> we would also benefit from partnerships with towns and cities in Turkey and the Middle East, as the people in these countries and in Germany often know very little about one another. The consequences of this ignorance are well known. Mistrust, prejudice and negative feelings that can lead on both a personal and a political level to the unnecessary and tragic failure of interculturalism. A further stage in this process of developing mutual cultural awareness exists at the parliamentary level, which is where I now work. In the German Bundestag, we have set up numerous parliamentary friendship groups that promote regular exchange between members of the Bundestag and representatives of other parliaments. I am a member of the German Greek 
and German-Spanish parliamentary friendship groups and of the Parliamentary Friendship Group for Relations with the States of Central America. As such, I can assure you that these groups are an instrument of cultural diplomacy that should not be underestimated. In this capacity, I've taken many trips with delegations which have sharpened my awareness of the specific cultural factors, the concerns and the priorities of the countries I have visited. The many personal contacts we made on these trips have helped me and my fellow parliamentarians to acquire a very deep insight into the mindset of our host countries. This means that we are now better able to base our political decisions on this cultural understanding than we were before. Often, it is not merely a matter of establishing good business contacts and of focusing on money. In many cases, we need to find out where our partners' real problems, problems lie, how they feel about them, and how they deal with them themselves. Incidentally, it is especially useful to broaden our horizons when it comes to the field of health policy, which is my area of expertise. We are all well aware that we can play an important role in providing health care to people in underdeveloped countries. But we can also learn a great deal from closely observing other cultures. How do other European countries deal with dementia and serious diseases? How do health systems in other parts of the world get families involved in care? What unorthodox medical experience could we look at to see if it might be useful in our everyday life? This exchange, ladies and gentlemen, is another important part of cultural diplomacy. On the global level, too, the need for regular exchange between members of parliament has long been recognized. The Geneva-based Interparliamentary Union was founded as far back as 1889. Since then, many regional parliamentary groups have been set up. These include the NATO Parliamentary Assembly for members of NATO countries, the Asian Interparliamentary Assembly, and the Parliamentarians Group GLOBE, which campaigns for the implementation of international commitments on the environment. Ladies and gentlemen, we politicians are, ulti are ultimately nothing more than representatives of the people who voted for us. <coughs> the personal contacts that result from exchanges between parliamentarians from all over the world are crucial to helping us better assess the interests and concerns of our people and to harmonizing these with the needs of people from our partner countries. We talk to each other as representatives of the people who voted for us and who do not have the chance to regularly hold these kinds of discussions themselves. This became particularly clear to me recently during discussions at the Conference on the Future of Liberalism in Greece. I heard first-hand accounts of the extent to which many of our Greek friends are suffering from the decades of economic mismanagement by their party leaders. I heard how they are asking us for help in their endeavors to bring about a long-term change of consciousness, even if this comes from a generational change, that will allow Greece shake off the disastrous effects of nepotism and corruption and to begin to prosper and flourish once again. At this point, please allow me to say a few more words on corruption. This global evil threatens to destroy many potentially wealthy nations. The fight against corruption has led many of us to define it 
as a cultural phenomenon that mainly affects poorer countries and those with a weak democratic tradition. We cannot completely deny this. Nevertheless, I would like to caution against sanctimony. Look at the corrupt activities that have come to light in a developed country like Germany. I mention Siemens as just one example. Look at the number of trials pending against banks for their corrupt activities, especially in the United States. And look at the scandalous manipulation of the labor rates in the financial world. This should be enough to show us that we are far from being, from being innocent and should by no means regard our Western countries as the only morally unassailable region in the world. Much of the nepotism and abuse of power that we see in other cultures also exists here. But it is more hidden, more artful in its structure. This reveals another lesson, lesson for cultural diplomacy. As representatives of Western culture, we will be far more credible <clears throat> if we admit to our, to our own mistakes, if we consistently seek to put them right, and if we refrain from trying to steamroll other countries with our own ideas, correct as they may be. We need empathy, respect and dialogue in order to act successfully in our interests. Parler is and will remain a fundamental component of amicable coexistence. As parliamentarians, our very profession means that we are and will always be inextricably linked to this notion. On that note, I look forward to a lively and interesting discussion. Thank you for your attention and excuse me for my coughing during this speech. Thank you very much, Mr. Lutter. I think it was very interesting for us to also hear what happens a little bit behind the scenes in Parliament in terms of this cultural diplomacy between parliamentarians, which, at least from my point of view, you don't see so much in the media. So I thought that was very insightful uh, to see, actually, <coughs> the, the cultural exchange and diplomacy yes. that does take place uh, in, in the uh, Parliament. Please, this is your chance for questions or comments to Mr. Lutter. And as always, if you could briefly introduce yourselves when posing the question, that would be great. Okay, we'll go here. And stand also, please, for the camera. Hi, I'm Giovanni, I'm from Italy, and I would like to ask you um, a question. Is, um, you are a member of the German and Greece and German and Spain Commission, and uh, these are two countries that are one of the, with it, with, together with my country, one of the most affected by the Euro crisis. And uh, w I would like to ask you if you uh, perceive that uh, this Euro crisis is threatening all the, uh, the relations between uh, the Southern European and the Germans, and is threatening all the progress that uh, you mentioned has been made since the creation of the European Union, of the, you know, the, the, the creation of a European identity. And uh, if these, uh, these kind of tensions, or to what extent these kind of tension can be actually be tamed by, uh, by the European leaders? Okay, thank you for these questions, by the way. Uh, there are difference, differences. Uh, Spain is much more affected than, for example, Italy. And the difference is that in Greece we have structures that are not working uh, effectively. And in Italy, by example, we have structures. We have a functioning middle class we have in Italy a very high rate of savings. People save money more than they do in Germany. And so we have to differentiate. And my opinion is that uh, Greece uh, won't have any other choice than perform structural reforms, whether within the euro or outside of the euro. But 
uh, as you read the papers, there was a political decision of our Chancellor, Mr. Merkel, uh, a political decision. We will keep Greece in the Euro zone. We don't want uh, to, how can I say, to destroy the, to, to, uh, we, we don't want to have a break uh, in the Eurozone. We don't want to destroy the Eurozone. But this means uh, Greece will need our help, our financial help, for decades, I say. Decades, that's my opinion. But there is a political decision. We won't uh, keep the Eurozone together. And by the way, it, I was not very happy by the comportment of some Greek demonstrators uh, against our Chancellor. I mean, we showed solidarity, we gave guarantees, and with the haircut, <coughs> the German taxpayer paid uh, 10 uh, billions of euros. So we were, we showed solidarity. And I would expect a minimum of uh, respect against a foreign chancellor, which Greek demonstrators lacked. And I was sad about this, what happened. But uh, I don't, uh, I don't, I, I don't bother, I, I, no, how can I say, I'm not in a sorrow about Italy. I think Italy will, will make its way, so you have to differentiate. Um, I have more concern about Spain, because the things in Spain are much worse. And they will also need our help, I think. But there is a political, it is not an economical uh, decision, it is a political decision. We want to save Europe in its uh, recent sh shape. Okay. Additional questions you'd like to pose in this context before we move to the interview context? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. My name is Amela Malia. I'm here on behalf of the German Bosnian Association in Berlin. And I would like to connect actually to your question. Do you think that the European crisis is also um, rather an opportunity for the countries of the Southern uh, uh, Europe to, um, to be more understood by the, um, by the uh, Nordic countries uh, like the Germany, uh, since there is a higher level of involvement now uh, through the European crisis. Okay, I think it, it's, it's a possibility to correct <coughs> the mistakes we made when the Euro and the Eurozone was born. Now we have the chance to correct this. And this means uh, to create a better financial teamwork, economic teamwork. And my vision, my vision would be a European constitution approved by the people uh, where we, where we uh, make European affairs together, where we solve European affairs together, like uh, defense policy, economic policy, as I, as I put it, foreign policy. This would be my, my vision that Europe develops in this direction and uh, this crisis could be a possibility, a chance, uh, to move things toward this direction. Excellent. Well, Mr. Lutter, I know you need to leave at 12.30, so I would suggest let's conclude the formal part of the lecture now, and then we can move, if you'd agree, to the interview section, where we can go into a little bit more depth some of okay. the, the other questions. But before we move there, if you could please join me in expressing our sincere gratitude to Mr. Erwin Lutter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.